As a taxonomist, I'm trained to look at things in a particular way, to see similarities and differences between various types of organisms. I have normally focused my attention on plants and wild animals, but lately I have thought of hominids. Also, as an instructor of ancestral skills, I study the methodologies of the indigenous, including those species and subspecies that have walked here before the anatomically modern human did, called Homo sapiens sapiens. The following words you will hear have come about through my study and through many conversations with Daniel Vitalis. It is of interest to me that despite following somewhat different paths, we have arrived at a fairly similar conclusion. If you study the tremendous amount of information that has been gathered regarding hominid evolution, a progression can be observed in the archaeological remains from Homo habilis to Homo erectus to Homo sapiens. The physical changes are perhaps most obvious. The later forms, or species, have relatively shorter arms, a less flared ribcage, and weaker dentition than the forms before them. These are all the result of mastery of fire and a diet rich in cooked food. The arms indicate less time spent in trees, once a safe method was developed of sleeping on the ground, that is, protection afforded by fire. The less flared ribs indicate less fermentation and more rapid transit time of food, food that was pre-digested by heat. The weaker dentition, the result of consuming softer food, food that was cooked by fire. Of interest is that fire starting was developed long before Homo sapiens walked the planet. Other changes are just as profound. These changes can be described as an increased proficiency in various skills, lithic technology resulting in more complex stone tools, fiber arts allowing construction of bowstrings, fishing nets, and ultimately fabric, Pyrotechnology, an increased understanding and awareness of fire, its use as a tool to bend wood, create adhesives, and ultimately build earthenware vessels. Homo sapiens is an extremely intelligent and well-adapted species. There is almost no ecosystem on the planet humans have not created helpful and fulfilling lives for themselves. Thinking of the changes between what archaeologists call the archaic humans and the anatomically modern humans, I now think of what changes have occurred between the anatomically modern human and contemporary people, in other words, city builders. The anatomically modern humans are represented by our indigenous populations prior to contact. They were stronger, healthier, and more intelligent. These are facts supported by examination of human remains. Prior to the advent of agriculture, humans were more vital. Agriculture, through breeding, produced genetically modified plants with altered levels of defensive chemicals, antioxidants, fatty acids, and nutrition. Contemporary humans are less robust, have smaller brains, suffer higher rates of dental infections, and possess weaker musculature. Our physiques have changed. Now think of the technologies that define each race of indigenous people. Their containers, hunting weapons, clothing, food, all specific to different peoples and different regions. The Inuit of the North can, in part, be defined by sinew cable-backed bows, harpoons, sealskin pokes for storing fruits and greens, seal oil lamps, and many other hand-constructed items. The Penobscots of Maine, defined by birch bark containers and watercraft, snowshoes, maple syrup gathering, and weirs for capturing eels. This discussion could go on at great length, listing the specialized items indigenous people made with their hands from materials gathered from the landscape. They were self-reliant, and they had detailed knowledge of plant ecology and animal habits. This was critical for securing food and nourishing the next generation. Their foresight can be seen in the health of their children. Now examine contemporary people. What are their skills? How would they be defined? 
If one looked objectively at this situation, they would see a people that are utterly dependent on the crafts and wares constructed in some distant land, unable to feed, clothe, or heal themselves. People who are essentially aliens on their own wild landscapes. People who are unable to decipher which plant species could be used for what purpose. Unable to build any hunting weapons. Lacking dietary wisdom and producing children with dietary deficiencies and physiological problems. Spending very little time outside the home, requiring a thermostat to be comfortable, and completely domesticated, possessing a blunted awareness of the plight of the world. It is clear that city builders have transferred the various skills and self-reliance from the individual to the civilization level. The humans act in concert to create the things that are needed with very few individuals possessing a broad spectrum of skills. This is relatively new. Hunter-gatherers lived in egalitarian bands and tribes. Self-reliance and nature competency was the norm. People were not defined by social classes, they were not taxed, and they were not exploited. Agricultural societies created food surpluses that allowed for the accumulation of physical wealth for the first time on the planet. It created states, political leaders, bureaucrats, and the like. It also led to disconnection from the landscape. People believed they had dominion over the earth. I would argue that hominid speciation has continued, and on the basis of physical changes, dietary changes, and social changes, that contemporary humans can no longer be classified as Homo sapiens sapiens, but now belong to a new subspecies called Homo sapiens domesticofragilis, so named because they are domesticated and more fragile than their indigenous ancestors. Their domestication has bred a population that can no longer see what produces health. They pollute the very world they require for survival and trust in elected leaders, demonstrating the altered social hierarchy present in most domesticated animals. Domestico fragilis has lost the incredible ability to perceive and function in the wild world. They are only at home in the urban landscape, where accruing debt allows them to secure the clothes and the items they require for survival. We can't go back to the indigenous lifestyle. Most of our landscapes are too fragmented and too altered to allow fully sufficient bands of people to live as wild beings. Property boundaries block the necessary migrations needed to move from growing season to winter hunting grounds. It simply isn't possible in most places. But it doesn't mean we have to continue on the path we are currently walking one of domestication. It has taken generations for contemporary humans to lose their ancestral skills and ancestral strength. The situation can't be corrected in one generation. It needs generations to alter mindsets, build strong healthy bodies, and relearn skills that promote self-reliance without polluting the landscape. Simply put, we need a new path. Imagine people who commit to learning the most sustainable technologies on the planet, who nourish their children so they are capable of seeing the state of our world and, like their parents, follow this new path of heightened physical, emotional, and spiritual health. Imagine a path where people possess the awareness of wild creatures and regain the connection to the landscape. Just like domestication has led to speciation, rewilding can as well. We can alter the present day course to recreate feral hominids, a population of people that combine ancestral skills with benign modern technologies. People who can once again feed, heal, and clothe themselves, who don't hide in their homes and have heightened senses of awareness people who would be classified 
as Homo sapiens neo-aboriginalis, the new aboriginals.